Today on Supreme Court Sunday, we're asking, do illegal immigrants have constitutional rights? By looking at the case of Zedvias v. Davis. Hmm, I wonder which one was the immigrant. Alright, so let's be real. I've never heard of this case before I did a recent report on Secretary Azar reuniting families. And neither of most of you unless you're an immigration lawyer. So why is this case important? Well, quick spoiler alert for anyone who doesn't want to know whether immigrants have constitutional rights until the end of this episode. But he fired off on Twitter, ignoring existing legal rights for undocumented immigrants. We must immediately, with no judges or court cases, bring them back from where they came. The president's edict fails to recognize constitutional due process, long established case law that grants that protection to non citizens. Yeah, nobody seems to cite this case by name, except in the written articles. But that's this case. So what happened? Well, this case is over something that happened in 1985, a time when Bill Clinton was president. And let me tell you, despite the fact that we still remember some of his extracurricular activities vividly, liberals prepare to take off your rose tinted glasses a little more. They use imposed burdens on our taxpayers. That's why our administration has moved aggressively to secure our borders more, by hiring a record number of new border guards, by deporting twice as many criminal aliens as ever before, by cracking down on illegal hiring, by barring welfare benefits to illegal aliens. In the budget I will present to you, we will try to do more to speed the deportation of illegal aliens who are arrested for crimes, to better identify illegal aliens in the workplace as recommended by the commission headed by former Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. We are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. It is wrong and ultimately self-defeating for a nation of immigrants to permit the kind of abuse of our immigration laws we have seen in recent years, and we must do more to stop it. Yeah, it was not a great time to be an immigrant in the United States, specifically because of the policy in question today, which makes Donald Trump's detention policies look like, well, weak on immigration. Basically the rules at the time were, the US could detain anybody ordered to be deported for 90 days. And if they missed that deadline, you know what happened? Well, the government came down hard and, oh wait, nothing happened? They could be detained indefinitely? Well, that's not great, because the government seems to have a way of just being able to tuck people in the corner filing cabinets and forget about them for a few years. That's kind of exactly what happened to our plaintiff. Zidvidias was a hard man to deport, because we weren't really sure where to send him. He was born from Lithuanian parents in a German displaced persons camp in 1948, and he was a citizen of neither country. He committed a few crimes in the US where he was an illegal immigrant and was ordered to be deported. Problem was, nobody wanted him. In 1994, he was put into holding for deportation. Then in 1995, Germany and Lithuania both said, nah, we'll pass, thank you though. Then in 1996, we tried to pass him off to the Dominican Republic, because why not? But they said no too, so he hung out in jail until 1997 when a court heard his habeas corpus plea and let him free. The government successfully appealed the decision and it went to the Supreme Court, which brings us to today, or more accurately, 2001. We'll hear argument now number 99791, uh, Kestutis Zadvitas versus the INS and John Ashcroft versus Kin Ho Ma. Yeah, this case also had the case of Cambodia and Kim Ho Ma attached, but that's like Batman and Robin. I think we know who people are paying to see. So let's get started, because who boy does the grand and potentially terrifying idea of a lifetime in prison because the US government can find a country to send you to quickly gets bogged down in the bureaucratic administrative law. This all comes down to an idea called Chevron deference. Which says that, if there's ever an ambiguous statute on the books, just defer to the agency the statute governs to determine how much power they have. The problem here is that, when you leave it up to an agency to determine how much power they have, well, they rarely look at the situation and say, well, if we're being honest, we should probably have less power. In this case, the vague statute said that. We're talking about the language 
may be detained beyond the removal period? That's correct. And what what Congress ha- has not done is specify how long beyond the how long following that, Mr. Chief Justice, they, they would intend to detain. It turns out that saying someone can be detained beyond the removal period was being treated as a life sentence. Because, hey, you never specified an hour, a week, or until they inevitably die in prison decades down the line. I mean, this is why every bill has to be the size of a John Steinbeck novel. Because if you leave anything up to the agencies, they'll take it to its most logically, legally acceptable conclusion. The question here was, can you detain someone who is an illegal immigrant literally forever in jail because no country will take them? Well, I'm surprised it took us more than 200 years to finally ask that question, but alas, here we are. If it was unconstitutional, then this agency's Chevron deference interpretation of the law would be void. Because Chevron deference simply doesn't apply when you're de- applying the constitutional avoidance doctrine. Because I, I believe that agencies are not, while they may have expertise at interpreting their own statute, they don't necessarily have an expertise in interpreting the Constitution. And yeah, you can't just say, eh, we'll see what the agencies want to do, if it goes against the literal founding document of our country. Oh, geez, the EPA has declared war on the executive branch? Did we have a statute that told them definitively that they can't do that? No? Darn. So now we have to figure out if the founding document covers people who are here illegally, specifically those who have gone to trial and received deportation orders. Well first, do they have any rights? At issue in this case, the constitutional issue in this case, is that people who enter this country are regarded as persons under the Constitution once they enter. That is the rule that pertains. Something that was made abundantly clear in this case was that the 14th Amendment guarantees all constitutional rights to all people who enter this country, legally, illegally, or, well, any sort of gray area. This is because the 14th Amendment, the one that ended slavery by recognizing black people as, well, people. It's the last part of this amendment that really stands out in this case, saying, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor denying to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Yeah, if that person is in our jurisdiction, they get equal rights. Might there be an exception, though? With respect to the status of the alien, it's important to consider the consequences of a final order of removal. It is not simply an order of removal. It also terminates the person's status as a lawful permanent resident. Yeah, so if you make it clear to everyone that this person is no longer a resident in America, are they no longer protected by the Constitution? Well, this brought us to a really weird concept. The, the point I'm trying to make is in terms of his legal status, he is in exactly the same legal status under the laws Congress has passed to protect this nation as someone who is at the border. Well, someone that, who has that no may right vary. To... I, I don't doubt that that is true so far as legal definitions are concerned, but that doesn't drive the constitutional inquiry. The constitutional inquiry, in effect, says, yeah, we'll accept the legal fiction that the person who has never been admitted is, in fact, not in the United States. Legal fiction, something that's great when it's the Pelican Brief, but a little alarming when it comes up in Supreme Court talks. Legal fiction, as designed by LegalDictionary.com, is an assumption that something occurred or someone or something exists, which in fact is not the case, but that is made in the law to enable a court to equitably resolve a matter before it. So basically, they were arguing that we know these people without legal status are in America, but, like, were they really in America? I mean, I know they're in our jurisdiction and we're holding them in our prisons, but what if we just assume they aren't because we legally kicked them out despite the fact that we didn't really kick them out? They also have a variety of precedent, although some of it you might not want to bring up. Their first example was... Long F-O-N-G... U, I think it is Y U E Ting T I N G, which says that Congress's power over power to expel aliens, in other words, to deport them, is the same and is as absolute as Congress's power to exclude aliens. He sounds pretty confident. He spelled it in everything. Well, that sounds like an important case to look into.
Poon Kang, if I'm right, was a case where the court was considering a law that said you had to have a credible white witness for a Chinese person to remain in the United States. Is that right? I, I believe that's correct. All right. So I'm not sure about the strength of that. No, but, no but with, <laughs> with respect. Wow. Wait, wait, seriously? It's never good when the precedent you're citing is pretty clearly racist as hell and more outdated than your high school email. I'm impressed with your resume. We'll be sending an email to you, callofdutylover69 at gmail.com soon. So while you could probably argue that in the year 2001, most people probably wouldn't want to expand on the legacy of this law requiring white witnesses for Chinese people to stay in the country, let's hear him out. Because in one of the worst offenses since Croatia in the World Cup, Scalia swooped in to save this argument. But I think the case is in point because as I understand your argument, the basis for the government's holding these people to which you're appealing is not that the government has the power to hold people who are dangerous. Precisely. What you're appealing to is the government's power to keep out of the United States people who have no right to be in the United States. That's, that is Period. Great recovery. We can extend the fact that we don't want Chinese people here to illegals. And if you think I'm exaggerating, just look at this case, Fang Yuting vs. United States. It happened in 1893 during the height of the Chinese Exclusion Act, basically the Muslim ban on steroids. At the time, Chinese legal residents in America had to get a certification of residency, and if they didn't, they could be arrested, forced to do hard labor, and deported after a year without committing any other crime. Well, three people were arrested and detained in New York, and they sued for habeas corpus because they couldn't find two credible white witnesses to testify on behalf of their residency, a requirement that, for this document, you needed to do. In a 6-3 opinion, the court said, meh, nothing wrong with what's going on here, and I don't know what to say. I guess that's now legal precedent reciting prominently in a 2001 legal immigration case. Because this is precedent though, you can see that in this case, the fact that they were not legally recognized as part of the country took away some of their habeas corpus rights. There was one other more credible piece of precedent that came up. Thank God, because if that's your defense in this case, I'm calling case dismissed right there. The exception to that rule is a very narrow exception, which is called the entry fiction, which is applied to people who are detained or interdicted at the border. And what the government is proposing here is to have the exception swallow the rule. Okay, don't worry, this one's bonkers as heck too. It's a 1953 case in which a non-U.S. citizen who had been residing in America went to Romania, and upon trying to get back to America through Ellis Island, was permanently banned from the country without trial by the Attorney General because of national security concerns. No other nation wanted him, so he just hung out on Ellis Island for 21 months. I mean, what? I know I don't leave my small apartment in Queens very much, if ever, but this is a pre-Netflix era. What are you gonna do there? He pleaded habeas corpus because, well, he was stuck on a small darn island for almost two years, and that'll give you a lot of time to think. The important part of this case was that their decision said that any non-citizen within the United States also has a constitutional right to traditional standards of fairness, regardless of whether they've entered the country lawfully or unlawfully. But non-citizens seeking entry have no protections under the Constitution and may be excluded without hearing. So essentially, if you want to get American rights, you just need to get into our jurisdiction and cross that border. With this understanding, there was one huge hiccup. So you have this guy who committed a crime, did the time for that crime, and is now legally deported. But no one will take him. I mean, he has constitutional rights, but can you just let him free in America? This person has no right to step foot on U.S. land. But we're going to be kind to that person and not dump them in the sea. We could say, you're excludable. So, but as the kind of price for saying, oh, we're going to let you set foot on land and not drown in the sea or starve to death, but we're going to treat you as though you never came in. And that, that's a fiction, but it's a benign fiction because the alternative is 
we dump you in the sea. Now, just to clarify, because this case has been so damn weird so far, she was not suggesting that we hold up dumping people in the sea as a legitimate alternative deportation strategy. So seriously, what do you do? Because if they're in America, they've got constitutional rights. Because of that darn goody two-shoes Abe Lincoln, well... The government has other alternatives in this uh, in this case and in these cases. They, they are not left unprotected. The INS retains a substantial statutory and regulatory authority to uh, supervise Mr. Ma and Mrs. Adidas uh, and, and the, those similarly situated. So basically, something like house arrest or ankle bracelets or regular check-ins with an officer. Now that we've gone over the arguments, are you excited to learn what happened? Well, on June 28, 2001, the Supreme Court said that these deported people in America still have constitutional rights, although they can be held for six months in detention. This was huge, with from 2001 to 2004, 134,000 immigrants with final deportation notices being released to the public. And because of this ruling, since 2008, about 4,000 immigrants with criminal records each year get released into the public. And while this sounds like something that should be read in a deep voice over a black and white picture of gang members attacking a Democrat, John Doe voted to let 4,000 immigrants out a year with criminal records. To be fair to them, they had already completed their prison time and were just sitting and holding. Which, while this doesn't really feel like a victory, we let out thousands of ex-cons who were said to be deported but nobody wanted them. That's kinda hard to woohoo to. And I'm picturing some strongly worded comments, but hey, the Constitution's pretty clear on this one. If they're in the United States jurisdiction, they have all the rights, and you can't hold them forever because of crimes they had previously committed and done time for. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, if you want to support independent journalism investigating the Supreme Court, subscribe to our YouTube channel for our weekly Supreme Court Saturday episodes where I look into an important Supreme Court case. As always, thank you for watching.